shall be the whole of the law. Hey everyone, Fredo Super Robo here again. Thanks for checking out my channel, where we are and always will be the home of common sense occultism and practical magic. Thank you for joining me today. Really quick, you know I'm going to say it. If you are new and you haven't already done so, please look below, find that big red subscribe button and hit that for me now. Then look to the right, you're going to see a bell. You want to make sure you hit that bell as well. That way you are notified each and every time we upload new content to this channel. And you can watch it as soon as humanly possible. One last thing, but definitely, definitely not least, please remember to like and share this and all videos. It goes a long way to helping us out, and it is very much appreciated. So for that, I thank you in advance. Thank you. Okay, uh, got all the YouTube creator jargon out of the way. First things first, tomorrow is Beltane. I want to wish everyone out there that celebrates Beltane a, and everyone who doesn't too. I want to wish you a happy Beltane. Uh, that also means it is the Eve of Beltane or the Eve of the Feast of Valpurgis or Valpurgisnacht or Hexanacht, which is Witch's Night uh, from the Germanic tradition. So, uh, happy Witch's Night to everyone and anyone out there celebrating or not celebrating. And happy Beltane tomorrow for everyone and anyone that celebrates the holidays of old. So, happy Beltane, happy Witches' Night, everybody. And again, as always, thanks for watching. Uh, okay, now, um, perfect topic, magical rituals. Because you may be doing a ritual or want to do a ritual for Beltane tomorrow. So, uh, the creation of magic rituals. Uh, we have reached the point uh, where we need to talk about this. In the beginner series, there is uh, a point where everyone is going to want to do a magical ritual, and you're going to need to know how to do that. Um, I know that when I started in my occult journey or magical journey or whatever you want to call it, um, as a as a teenager, I, I thought that. You know, you, you got into this, and uh, there was just gonna, there was going to be like a book, like uh, someone was going to hand me a book, and it was literally going to spell out everything, like line A, say this, drop this into a pot, line B, say this in a foreign language. These are the exact words you use. These are the exact movements you make, and it's guaranteed that you have this within a week's time or whatever uh, the spell or whatever's for. So, uh, of course, I found out that that is not the case um, very, very quickly. Um, I, I'm not saying that there aren't ritual books out there with detailed instruction or spell books or things of that nature that have effective word-for-word um, -word workings because there is stuff out there like that. But uh, there by no means is a step-by-step um, -step perfect instruction manual, I guess you would say. And uh, that was, a, like I said, that was a big wake-up call to me because I thought that, you know, uh, and this is, you know, the TV and movies and stuff like that uh, and rumor mill and all that stuff. Uh, that, that, that it's it's the fault of that probably but you know because you see these guys you know you see a bunch of uh successful people getting together in a you know a, a forest grove wearing black robes or a, a uh you know a, a big freaking temple and you know they, they're throwing stuff into the fire and yada 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 and they take the big book from off the the altar and they read it and you know, then boom, fire explodes and, you know, the heavens open and, and all that goodness starts to rain and thunder and lightning. And, uh, it, you know, so you have that impression in your mind of, uh, you know, even though we know that's not the way magic is, but, you know, we have that impression that there's this big book out there somewhere and it tells you absolutely everything. Okay. Um, so we've established that that is not the case. Uh, how do we go about this creating these rituals? Um, I'm going to be going over today uh, because there's many ways. First of all, let me let me let me preface this by saying there are many ways of constructing a magical ritual, and uh, what I'm going to go over today is not the end all be all. It is not the only way. 
um, to construct a ritual for the purposes of magic. Um, and as always, I uh, will start out by saying if you are working a specific training program or um, you're involved in a magical fraternal order that provides instruction or a coven of some sort or even if you just, you know, you have a simple uh, group of solitary uh, magicians or witches, if you call yourself witches or whatever, uh, that get together and do magic, uh, please, before doing any of this, consult with your superior or your instructor or teacher or guru or whatever. Um, it's always important to um, consult with the person that's giving you lessons because if, if you have one. Um, or like I said, if you're working within a group context, uh, it's important you let others know what you would like to do and to discuss it. Because um, especially if you're going to look at it from a, a mentor uh, way, uh, the, the teacher provides, or at least they should, they provide a very specific curriculum and that is for a specific purpose. And um, there's reasons behind that. So you don't want to necessarily um, deviate from that structure, especially in the beginning, uh, because it can be detrimental. So uh, there, there's a plan when it comes to initiation and group work and one-on-one -on -one teacher student relationships. So I'm not saying don't do what I'm doing, what I'm what I'm suggesting to you. I, I very much would love you to try it, but I'm just saying be informed and if you do work within a group context, please consult with your instructor beforehand. Okay? Boom. So we got that disclaimer out of the way. Um, so what I'm going to be go going over today is a basic golden dawn, I guess is what I'm going to call it. I'm, yeah, I'm going to call it a Rosicrucian or golden dawn ritual style format uh, based on Hermetic Kabbalah. Uh, if you're watching this channel, your interests probably lean towards that type of magic anyway. But as I said, again, there is, this is not the only way. Uh, this is not the only way I practice, and it's not the only way in general. So if you are as green as green can be, and you've never done a magic ritual, and you think this is just over the top, or it doesn't resonate with you, don't say, oh crap, I can't do magic, I don't want to do magic, this is just, I'm not feeling this, because if this is the way you have to do ritual, I don't want to do ritual. So, please, again, this is not the only way, but this is a very effective way, and it is one of many. So, bear with me, and we're going to go over that today. And also, just note, we will be going over different ways to make ritual in future videos. So, you know... If this isn't your, if this is not your cup of tea, <laughs> if this is not your cup of tea, uh, stick with us, and you'll 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 definitely discover something else, whether it be from me or from uh, another uh, source. So, again, I had a brain fart there, but we're today we're going to be going over the uh, a, a Rosicrucian Golden Dawn Hermetic Kabbalah style ritual, a way to uh, set a ritual up and create a ritual. Uh, I'm not performing a ritual today. Um, that would be, that would take way too long. Not that these things take hours and hours, but just for a, a video sense to do a full-blown magical ritual, at least the kind that I do, it would just, it would take, as much as I talk anyway, it would, it would take way too long. We'd be here all night. Um, and I still got to celebrate, uh, Beltane and Witch's Night and do a ritual myself, so uh, I won't be doing a ritual on camera, but uh, we are going to go over what to do when you are setting up this type of ritual. So, first and foremost, what you want to do is uh, you want to know what you're doing the ritual for. So, the uh, people always talk, you hear intent, 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 and Intent is what matters, and yes, intent is what matters, very much so because it is the first 
thing that you're going to do. You are going to have to come up with an idea of what the ritual is for if you're going to do a ritual. Um, that's pretty self-explanatory, but again, I like to be thorough, so I'm going to be thorough. So you want to have an idea of what you want to accomplish. You've decided you're going to use magic for something. What is that something? What is the purpose of this ritual or rite? That's the first thing you're going to do. That's the easy part for the most part. That's that's the easy part. Now, after that, uh, you're obviously going to want to create the ritual. You want to make this happen. Now, you, you might hear this a lot in um, maybe from other YouTubers or you read in a book. You'll hear this, this, this terminology of a, of a thought, word, and deed sequence, and that's how you structure ritual. And um, I'm not going to overuse that terminology, but it, it, it is a very much a, a thought, word, and deed sequence. So you have the thought of what you're going to do. You have the word, and then you have the action. Of actually doing it and things come to fruition so um, let's see what's the easiest way to approach this when doing when when sitting down to do a ritual uh, it is usually recommended that one do a form of divination beforehand um, not necessarily right beforehand uh, but before you even do the writing of the ritual, usually. Um, again, I'm not going to get into uh, something super, super complicated in this video, but uh, certain things, like uh, if you're doing a form of planetary magic or zodiacal magic, uh, things are going to matter, like the positions of the planets and the heavens and uh, also stuff within your own astrological chart can matter so there's all sorts of little details um, that we're, we're not going to go into today but there are s some details that you're going to want to hash out and doing a divination whether it be a astrological chart uh, a horoscope whether it be a, a tarot reading, which is what most opt to do, uh, a I Ching reading, a uh, if you, if you're into geomancy and you do a geomantic reading, now, even if you're going to do the whole casting of the runes thing and and do something like that, um, some form of divination is usually recommended before performing a ritual, uh, and and you do this because. Now, I'm not saying it's always necessary, so I, I don't believe in always, usually, uh, but it's a good idea, especially for certain types of magic. And why, why would you do this? Why would you do divination? Um, because you know you want to do the ritual, obviously. Um, so why do you need to do a divination? Because it can be seen as a way of figuring out if it's the right time to do the ritual. A lot of times we get uh, want confused with will, and it may be beneficial to wait to do a, uh, a ritual for A, B, or C. You know, uh, the timing just might not be right for whatever reason. And um, in the greater you know, consciousness of the world. Uh, divination is a way of figuring this out. Um, it's a way of looking into things. So, a divination is recommended. So, once you figure out what you want to do, um, it is usually recommended that you do a divination to see whether you should do it right away or not. Or, if you're doing, uh, like I said, some form of astrological magic, when you should, if it's the right timing. Um, things to take into account that I think are usually, that are important 9 out of 10 times. 
And one is the moon phase. Um, when doing a, a ritual, I, I think the moon phase is important, whether it's waxing or waning, because um, uh, th there's a lot of reasons. But just for one, it is, it is a very primary influence uh, on us here. It is our satellite, quite literally, and it is the closest thing to us. So, it is good to kind of follow the rules of the moon phase, so to speak. Um, again, it all depends on what type of magic you're doing, but the general rule of thumb is, you know, to bring things into you, um, you would perform said magic during the waxing phase. If you were trying to send something away, some sort of energy away, or some sort of protective type amulytic magic of sorts, uh, that could be done during the waning phase of the moon. Uh, full moon is always good, in my opinion, to do magic. I'm sure there will be some that disagree. And uh, the new moon is good as well. Um, depending on what you're doing. So, uh, before anybody blows up the comments section and say, Oh, no, don't do it. He's a black magician. Dark moon and black moon and new moon rituals. Black magic man. Before we get into any of that, um, I will say it depends on what you're doing. But you can very much do magic at any time. Uh, doesn't matter the phase of the moon it can be done, but as I stated before, your results may vary depending on time and place. All sorts of things can uh, be taken into account. Um, and we've got it good now, guys. We've got it real good uh, as far as the astrological stuff is. I mean, can you imagine, like, you know... Years and years ago, hundreds of years ago, or even thousands of years ago, when the guy, you, you know, you had to know how to calculate this on your own. And by the way, that's something I, I recommend that we you uh, look into is, is doing the calculations yourself because, you know, all knowledge is great. So um, I'm not telling you to not do this and not do things that are difficult um, just because. But... I'm saying that there really should be no excuse uh, why we can't look into things like the positions, the exact, the real positions of the planets um, astronomically and the moon phase and things like that. I mean, because uh, I'm pretty sure if you're watching this, I uh, pretty much guarantee you probably have a smartphone um, or if you're watching on the computer, you know, you, you can look it up like that. It's a split second. You're, uh, we're on YouTube. So I know you got the internet. Um, and we just, we have so many tools available to us to be able to pinpoint and calculate actual, literal um, details for magic ritual when it comes to the position of the heavens. Uh, there's just no excuse for, I don't feel like it. So, um, again, especially if you're doing some form of astrological magic. So, Anyway, again, that's something that I recommend you look into before doing a ritual. So you want to do your research. Um, so let's review. So far, we've got come up with an intention, ritual purpose. Then we have do a divination um, to discover whether we're going to do it or not. Uh, three, time and place. Say we've done the divination. The tarot reading we have the affirmative that it's good and then uh what leans into what we're leading into is what i was already talking about is choosing a time and a place for said ritual so we know what we're going to do we know that it's okay to do it and now we want to choose when exactly we want to do it now as with most things in magic that depends. Uh, the answer is it depends. When do you want to do the magic ritual? Well, it depends on your purpose of the ritual. If you are doing a 
let's say, let's do a planet. Well, we'll stick with the planetary model right now. If you're doing a ritual that has a very martial intent, um, something for, let's say, athleticism. Say you want to be able to become a greater athlete or inc increase your athletic prowess or something of that nature, and you feel that martial energy is a competitive spirit, you want to bring that energy into some sort of talisman um, to wear and keep with you. Well, you're not going to do a martial ritual on the day of Venus. This is not going to happen, so you're not going to want to do it on Friday. Um, no, and, and I'm not getting ahead of myself here either because I'm, I'm bringing around to how you're going to do this. Uh, if anyone has watched my previous video on must-have books for uh, people starting out in magic, um, one of them that I listed was the 777 tables. So when we're talking about what time to do certain things and it depends on what we're doing where are we getting this information from well of course you could always look it up on the internet but again I think it's important to be able to do these things on our own uh, especially when it's something just as simple as looking through a book so um, I mentioned this book in a previous video, which is the uh, 777 and other Kabbalistic writings of Aleister Crowley. It's also in, um, you can find these tables in book four uh, or um, Magic Libra Abba. I would pick that up and show it to you right now, but it's acting as a microphone stand. <laughs> so, uh, so everything doesn't topple over. Um, Book four is going to stay right here. Um, but nonetheless, those things are available in book four as well. So what we have in this book, this 777, which is uh, available on hermetic.com. You can see all the tables. You can look them up, and they're right there. But the important – so if you don't have the book, you can still get uh, the information, guys. There's you know no reason we can't get a hold of this information. It's there and ready for us. So all we got to do is, you know, a couple keystrokes or, um, you know, look in our handy-dandy copy of 777. So how do you use this book? Um, it is a series of tables. And if you're into hermetic magic and hermetic Kabbalah, you know we have this thing. It's sitting right behind me, uh, this uh, tree of life. Uh, the Hermetic or Kabbalistic Tree of Life. And it consists of 10 spheres, or 11, if you want to ask me or a lot of other magicians. It consists of 11 spheres, or Sephiroth. Um, and they all have various correspondences and meanings and different types of energies. And we, we're going to do a video on the Tree of Life at another time. But uh, most of you probably know this already. But my, my reason for bringing it up now is this book has all those correspondences that fit on that tree. That doesn't really look like a tree, but it, nonetheless, it is a tree, a tree of life. So there's a lot of symbolism that, again, we research and we discover what we're going to do for our purpose that we originally set out to do. So what I recommend, the easiest thing to do is pick as much as you can. Again, if we're going to go into the example that I was just using, doing a ritual, some sort of martial type of ritual, um, we would look up the sphere of Gevura and see all kinds of stuff. So, you know, if we go in, there is the table of correspondences, and you'll see the gods uh, that correspond to Gaborah. You'll see, obviously, it's Mars which corresponds to it. Um, 
also there's the very strong you know Aries energy as well even though it's not ruled by Aries but you know so I'm not don't get it don't be a stickler for me but uh, you get what I'm trying to say also you can look up the plant for Mars the incense all sorts of stuff and this these are things that you're going to bring into the ritual so if you haven't figured it out already, there's a lot of prep work that goes into this. This isn't just something you're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to do a ritual and boom, I'm doing it now, yada, 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 and it all comes together in your head and, you know, you can do it five minutes later. Um, I mean, you could, but uh, usually it's better to plan for these things and you get you get just like anything else. I, I'm sure you, your, your parents told you. At some point in your life, you, you get back what you put in. It's the same thing with magic. You, you get back what you put into it. So if you put very little into your ritual preparation, you know, you're probably not going to get as much back as if you really went hard and you looked for the correspondences and all these little things that will help you get in that zone, um, that proper mode of consciousness, and to have all of these things that have, some say actual power, some say symbolic power. I will leave that up to you um, and won't go into my opinion on that, but needless to say, Every little bit helps, whether it is all symbolism or whether um, these things such as plants and uh, incenses have, you know, actual, you know, divine or energetic properties and power. So the point is, do your research and figure all this stuff out. Um, again, this video is about creating a ritual. So these are the things you're going to need to do in order to do the ritual. Um, so we have an intent, we have a purpose, we said it's okay, uh, we got the clear through divination, and then with time and place, we figured out what time we want to do it, if we're doing a planetary ritual, um, if we're bringing something in, it's the waxing phase, um, and now we're starting to gather the things we need for the ritual, which, again, you go to 777. Now, when it comes to actual ritual setup, this is a basic format, okay? So, um, here is probably what you were expecting to see when you originally clicked on this title, is what do I do, step one, step two, step three. Um, whereas what I was just talking about was strictly prep work and things to do beforehand, which I think is very important. Um, so, when you've got all of your implements together, you've got your night picked out or your day picked out, depending on what you're doing, and um, like I said, you got the okay, you got everything, um, these are the steps I recommend that one takes to do a Golden Dawny style ritual. One... I think it is important to start with a ritual cleansing or bath of some sort. Um, shower is okay as well. I don't literally mean you have to sit in a bathtub. Um, but some form of cleaning the body. If it is possible, it should be done. We are getting ready. Magic is something, um, as, as the rant that I went on in my devotion video, ra magic is something that is holy and this should be treated as a sacred, religious type um, ceremony. Even if you're not religious and you, you hate religion, this should be treated as something sacred and have that same feeling that people have when they are involved in a religious experience. Let's put it that way. So... You're not going to show up, or at least I hope you wouldn't, you're not going to show up to uh, church service all stinky uh, <laughs> if you can help it. So a cleansing of the body helps. This is something that transcends all magical traditions. 
this idea of a magical cleansing, uh, of cleansing yourself and purifying yourself before anything even starts. Sometimes, again, it depends on the type of magic that you're doing. In some forms of magic, there are days and days of preparation and cleanliness, several specific baths with certain herbs and things of that nature before we even walk into the temple to do ritual. So, ritual bath, step one. Um, we also, this, this idea of cleanliness and, and godliness, on, on that same theme, we want to make sure our working area is clean as well, uh, physically clean, uh, as, as well as energetically clean. We'll, we'll talk about that more in just a second. Um, but actually physically clean. Your personal temple, even if it's not always a temple at all times, what you're using as your personal temple, when you're going in to do something holy, you want to, again, treat it with reverence, and you don't want crap all over the place. So you want a clean area. So that way you have a, a, a environment of respect. You're bringing in certain energies, whether you see them as actual, you know, beings or not. Um, it is best to treat things as with respect. You're bringing in these things. You want your area to be clean. Not to mention that it's just easier to move around. A lot of ritual involves movement and moving around. And if you are tripping over um, your dirty laundry or your tennis shoes or something uh, in the middle of your magic circle, well, you know, it's, it's going to throw off the atmosphere of the ritual. So, um, you know, straighten up a little bit. Uh, so we clean ourselves. We clean our working space, literally. Now, um, I, I will be doing some more rituals as far as getting into and a, a, a spiritual bath and um, cleansing uh, because that can be very specific as well, as I mentioned. But for now, I would just say spiritual bath. So some sort of cleansing with water. We cleanse ourselves. We cleanse the area. Then uh, we go into our temple our working area, whether it be inside or outside. And the way to start most of these, um, there is some form of invoking the higher or the highest aspect of divinity as you see fit. Um, this is done in many different ways. I've found um, a lot of times you'll see videos or uh, podcasts and things on this, and they'll say invoke the high, but then they don't do anything, and then they lead right into do the LVRP. Um, but there really was no invoking of the high, and it kind of, you know, it throw it to me at least it threw off instructions when I was listening to these type of things. But anyway, uh, you can you can get this done by simply saying as you walk in and you're about to start. A, a very short prayer to, you know, whatever you see as the highest um, aspect of source or the all or whatever, um, the, the holy guardian angel, um, whatever you feel connected to, um, and or, you know, it may be a specific deity that you see as a chief um, god above all gods if you function in a, uh, a monolardy type of um, religion or spiritual path. So, yeah, just something short. A uh, real easy one is the whole uh, adoration to the Lord of the Universe. That's a real quick one. Um, that's, that's, that's good. You know, holy art thou, Lord of the Universe. Holy art thou, whom nature hath not formed. Holy art thou, the vast and mighty one. Lord of the light and the darkness. Sorry for shaky cam. Um... You know, a, a real simple prayer. Anything from the heart works as well, too. Dear Lord, watch over me as I uh, attempt this holy act. Um, in the holy name of God, amen. So mode it be. Something like that. Something that's sincere, succinct. Doesn't have to be long. But 
uh, I think it's important to open with that. Even though you're going to do that again, you're going to do it again later. <laughs> but just something simple to get you in that um, frame of mind. Then uh, relaxation. So uh, this is this is Freddy Super Robo's steps 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 <sighs> to success in a magical ritual. Um, spiritual bath, cleaning the area, real quick prayer to invoke the high. Then a period of relaxation. Get yourself relaxed and in that uh, altered state of. I'm doing uh, uh, that altered state of consciousness. I'm not necessarily a trance, even though it is a trance, but um, getting to that state where you're relaxed and you're in that reverential frame of mind uh, is going to make all the difference. You need to be relaxed, but also focused at the same time. And I know that sounds weird, but trust me, when you get it, you will get it. Um, and it just takes practice, just like anything else. So we get relaxed. And then um, I always recommend working within some form of energetic or magic circle. So I said uh, we're doing the Golden Dawn Rosicrucian style. Uh, that's what I'm going to go over today. So this would be your point where you would open with your lesser ritual of the pentagram. Uh, a lot of people would like to follow that with a uh, lesser hexagram ritual, and that's fine. It's not always necessary, but a lot of people feel that that's the format, and that's how they do, and that's how they get successful. Um, that's how they gain success out of their magic, and they just work that way forever, and that's fine. And they'll do ritual of the pentagram, ritual of the hexagram, boom, and that's their opening. Uh, Star Ruby, Star Sapphire for Thelemites uh, is always an option, a great option to open as well. After this, then, uh, we further consecrate the temple a holy place. So we will go, uh, we purify, and then we consecrate. So we purify the space for, further energetically with water, usually with salt and water, um, you know, just doing something simple like going around to the, the four cardinal directions and I purify the east, I purify the south, I purify the west, I purify the north. And you do the same thing with fire, um, either a candle or incense. Because, and then we have all the elements. So we further cleanse the area, setting it up for this holy working. And then we've consecrated it. We've made it holy via consecration through incense and fire. Then, the next step would be doing the actual act of magic. Some way to connect with that force that you're trying to bring in. So... I'm going to use the example of a planetary talisman. You have an object that you've uh, created, it has several symbols on it that pertain to, let's say, Mercury, because you, you need to obtain knowledge and you want to uh, have Mercury on, si on your side since it's communication and knowledge. All right? So, and, and you want to be, say you want, we'll go with communication. We want to communicate better. You got a speech coming up, you got to write a speech. And uh, you're doing this ritual for um, to be the best speech it can possibly be. So we use mercury for that. Uh, so you've made a talisman with all sorts of mercurial symbols and uh, gods and, and, and all that stuff. It's on the talisman. You have that sitting on your altar. Um, what we then need to do is the actual magic of the magic. It's bringing in that force. So... Uh, at this point, most people would, again, call in the, um, the highest of the high to kind of plug in. Uh, it, it's not necessarily uh, a must, but if you didn't do it before, you need to do it now. Uh, you need to do some sort of general invocation. Uh, this could be by way of, again, 
that adoration of Lord of the Universe. This could be an Our Father prayer. Um, this could be a middle pillar exercise is a great one for plugging into uh, source or the highest of the high. Um, there's a really good example out there of what we're doing here is to take the example of a television set. We're plugging the TV into the power source um, via ritual. So we take the plug and we plug it in to get the electricity. All right. So we plug in to the God force, the, the general. And then after that, then you would find a way to bring in the specific force, that mercurial force that we talked about. That's the next step. We went from general, then we go to specific. So again, to use the TV analogy, if you want to watch, I don't know, reality TV, you're going to turn to music television, MTV, oddly enough. But um, it's that idea of changing the channel, tuning the radio dial, finding the frequency, that specific energy that you're going to bring in. So how do we accomplish this? By different invocations of certain specific deities. Um, if it's a planetary energy, we could accomplish this by a specific invoking greater hexagram ritual. Um, to use the mercury example, doing you know hexagrams of mercury. Um, if it's elemental, um, doing uh, elemental pentagram ritual. All of these things, these are all options, and this all is going to be planned out. This is stuff that you do in that research phase, what you're going to do when you write out the steps. But this is the point where you do that. We're finding that specific energy. So, again, at that point, we're doing some form of bringing in what we need. Whether it's inflaming yourself with prayer, just strictly word and invocation only. Whether it's the ritualized actions of drawing the symbols of the hexagrams or pentagrams um, in the specific manner. Whether it's some form of initial, uh, ritualized dance. Um, anything, you know, spinning around, you know, uh, if you're outside, you know, there's all sorts of things you could do. Um, so, some way to bring in that force. Then, um, using the example of a talisman, you want to have a way of locking in that force. You don't want to just call it and then it's just, okay, it's here or whatever. Uh, generally, there's a way of locking in that force. Now, using the example of a talisman, we've made the talisman. We're bringing that energy into the talisman. So, calling upon that energy, however we've done it, and then bringing it through our aura, our sphere of sensation, and projecting it at the peak, at its peak, the peak of the raising of energy. However you've got it written out, at its peak, you project it through yourself out of your aura into that object, that talisman, whatever you're using it as, whether it's a piece of jewelry or whether it's um, a ring or whether it is um, a paper talisman, a metal talisman, anything like that, something to lock in the force. You're projecting that in there. Um, also, Eucharistic magic is great because you call the force into food and then you consume it. So in a sense, you are consuming into your actual body in a physical form that energy. Again, to use another example I've heard, you take something, you make it God, and then you consume it and put it into yourself. Therefore, making yourself like God, just like communion in church um yes it's very magical it's all magic guys um so my point is is you must have something to work within this paradigm you must have something a way of locking in that force so we call in the force we lock it in 
and then we have this. And that's that's the big part. That's the um, that's the magic of the magic, as I would say. After that, you would then dismiss. You would thank first uh, any forces or spirits or energies that you um, had called into that. You would wrap up your your talisman, or of course, if you made a Eucharist, you would eat it or, or drink the wine or or whatever. Um, you thank the specific energies. You thank the Most High, however you understand it, or your Holy Guardian Angel, or all of the above. And um, then you would proceed to close. Now, there are many different ways uh, of doing this, but uh, most people would suggest doing a, a banishing pentagram ritual again. Uh, and a banishing hexagram ritual, that's fine. Um, it, it really depends what you're doing. I find a lot of the time a simple license to depart is, uh, is plenty to suffice. Something like, in the name of the Most High, um, I, I, call, I, I, I tell any spirits that may have been imprisoned by this ceremony um, to depart now to your abodes and habitations. Harm none in your passing. May there be peace between me and thee and be ready to come again when called. Thank you. I bid you hail and farewell. Something like that. Um, and then closing the, the, the temple itself, either by walking Wittershins around the circle, if you open clockwise, uh, walking Wittershins and, uh, and, and, and closing that energetic uh, focal point. Uh, saying some sort of closing thing like the the gate of the east is closed in peace the gate of the west is closed the gate of the south is closed and the gate of the north is closed we are all at peace and i declare this um holy place this ritual accomplished and over so mote it be knock the altar with a gavel or you know the end of your magical knife or your wand or something like that um i don't recommend bells at the end, because bells have that, uh, they have a, uh, a resonance with calling spirits and the like, so bells early in the beginning, great, uh, and in the middle, but at the end, let's stick with, with knocks, uh, that's just my opinion, but yeah, there you have it, that is a framework that you can use, and I know I talked a long time about this, but um, it is quite simple down to a, a few steps. Really, we cleanse ourselves and the area physically. Then we energetically cleanse the area. We make it holy. We plug into the general aspect, the general source. And then we bring in the specific source. We have something to lock it in. And then we bring it into ourselves or we have it to hold. And then... We thank and dismiss and close. I know it sounds a lot simpler when I say it like that. And there, there is an awful lot of work that goes into it. But um, I just I wanted to give a basic framework for this type of ritual. There's, there's more and I can follow up. I can do a part two if you'd like. Just let me know in the comment section. But um, I try to give things a, a, from my perspective... Uh, to make it at least, you know, like I said, from a common sense perspective and to, to make sense to anyone. So, uh, because I didn't have that. And I want people to be able to understand things and it not be a bunch of, you know, confusing jargon. Um, there's plenty of that in the more advanced stages. <laughs> so, uh, when we're learning and we're doing stuff, we, we don't want to get discouraged with things like that. We want to get our feet wet and uh, make things um, and set ourselves up for success, not failure. Success is thy fruit. So, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'll be back again here soon. Um, check out the description box. Uh Lots of cool stuff in there. Team merch if you want to help support the uh, the message here and uh, become part of the team. Check out some of the rewards as too.
uh, for Patreon and, uh, again, the merch store and all that cool stuff. So follow me on Facebook and Twitter and Instagrams and all that cool stuff. Everything is below in the description box. So till next time, I wish you all a very happy Beltane. And, um, yeah, I'll see you soon. Love is the law. Love under will.